Okay, we welcome the first speaker of the proposition. You are not audible, I suspect, because you are muted. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, may I confirm that I'm audible and visible without any weird sounds? Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm just going to set up my timer. Okay. My speech is going to start shortly. My speech will start in three, two, one. If you look at all around the African continent, you will find very few examples of functional democracies. Most democracies only exist on paper, where in reality, elections are rigged, economic elites capture politics, and people live in constant fear of violent military oppression. We would much rather live in a world with the economy and landish redistribution was the priority because having an access to the foundation of basic economic activities is the only way to a minimum level of sustenance, reduction violent activities, and long-term political stability so proud to propose. Two arguments from first. Firstly, why the breaking down of economic privileges are necessary for economic activation. Secondly, why economic reform leads to greater political accountability. But before moving into the arguments, Two points of setup. Firstly, on our stance. Our goal is simple. We want to break down existing economic privileges and redistribute them to the people through two methods. A, we're happy to confiscate the wealth of the super rich and redistribute this to the people on the ground. But B, we're happy to redistribute the sources of wealth, which essentially is land, which was controlled by ex-colonial powers, as well as local elites who were prioritized in the colonial regime. The second point of setup on what both worlds look like. Firstly, what are we willing to trade off on our side of the house? We're happy to give up on democratic reforms. For example, the right to vote, the right to protest, since our claim is that these will not be respected anyways on opposition world. But secondly, what do we imagine our world to look like? We think it is likely to look like a set of non-elected officials crafting and implementing policies. For example, we think this looks like in Indonesia, where prominent nationalists who fought for independence collectively made decisions with Skarno as an unelected president. Obviously, we're happy to concede that this body is not completely accountable, but we think there's a significant interest in uniting the country, as the period immediately after colonialism coincides with the peak of nationalism, where the people, prominent nationalists in particular, are bound against a common enemy that is the symbolism of colonialism. Given this setup, first argument then, why the breaking down of economic privileges are necessary for economic activation. The thesis under this is that economic and land reforms are necessary for people to live a fulfilled life and uniquely get that on side opposition. Why then does economic privileges actively Point. shackle people to endless poverty? Two reasons and points in chat, please. Firstly, because landowners have massive leverage over individuals. This is to say people are forced to make unfair concessions to landowners because they're economically dependent on them. Intuitively, they need that land to farm, so they're naturally forced to listen to the plantation owners. This means two things. A, they live under harsh conditions where most of their profit are sucked away by landowners. But B, they're often forced to stay in a particular piece of land for a long amount of time due to their contracts, which deprives their mobility. The second reason is that it is empirically true that African countries are resource rich, but these resources are monopolized by elites. This looks like the United Africa Company under the British government monopolizing oil in Nigeria. The profits earned through the excavation of these resources are hoarded by Western elites, which comes at the massive opportunity cost of bringing that wealth to the people on the ground. These two mechanisms prove that poor people in Africa will structurally continue to stay poor in the future. What is the comparative then? Firstly, in the short term, wealth redistribution allows people to survive, it allows people to have food on the table and pay their rent. But second of all, in the long term, greater economic opportunities accrue in two ways. One, individuals are able to access greater earnings. Now that farmers aren't sucked up most of their profit and can use that leftover money, but also have ownership of land, means they can produce more crops, make harvest more efficient, and able to start up new businesses. But two, the country is able to access increased economic opportunities in three ways. 
Firstly, the increased size of local market. People being wealthier means local companies in domestic markets are likely to thrive, creating more job opportunities. But secondly, increased supply of cheap labor. In so far as individuals are not constrained to landlords anymore, this means they can now seek employment in alternative jobs in these cities, and provide uh, which provides attractive cheap labor to companies, and especially foreign more international companies, which means there's more investment, especially from foreign countries. Thirdly, we take back control over lucrative natural resources. This looks like Botswana regaining their diamond industry, Nigeria regaining their oil industry, which gets a lot of profit. But the difference is the profit is now to the people of the country. All these proves that we enable people to become more economic affluent in the future. Obviously, this is debate winning, important in and of itself, since the vast majority of people living in African countries are devastating poor, and we uniquely help that on our side of the house. But this argument also has another implication in the round as well, since we would argue that greater economic capacity leads to greater democratic accountability, which leads to my second argument. But for that, I'll take a POI. Your only incentive as to why this economic redistribution will be done well is that they want to fight against colonialism. If we already are in a post-colonial state, why isn't an overriding incentive to favor your more your closer ethnicity and to favor your cronies and the I already gave you three independent mechanisms why it's likely that the individuals are allowed on the ground are able to access economic benefits. I think that's independent from the POI and what you're talking about on your side of the house. The second argument then, why economic reform leads to greater political accountability. The thesis under this is that economic liberation leads to better accountability in the long term, in the most successful instance, democratization. Two reasons why this is the case. Firstly, Economic development creates greater incentives and capacities on the part of the people to hold governments to account. This is because when people have achieved minimal economic rights, they're likely to start asking for higher levels of rights, like political rights, and have greater capacity to spend their time organizing rallies and gaining information through media. But secondly, the cost of oppression for government becomes higher. This is because when people become richer, they have higher capacity to unionize or fund opposition powers like the military or opposition party leaders in ways that undermine the current government. Thus, people now have a higher capacity to become significant threat to the state. These reasons prove why you're likely to get accountability on our side of the house. On the comparative, we would argue that political reform will not create accountable system for three reasons. Firstly, because democratic institutions are very weak. This is because, for example, there's a lack of system that effectively supervises electoral conducts in many countries. This means elections under opposition have to rely on the good faith of potential candidates. But this is problematic because there's obviously incentive to cheat, like stuffing the ballot box or rigging the election, because not cheating means you significantly reduce the chance of you winning the election since you cannot gather other politicians not cheating. Thus, this becomes a race to the bottom. But secondly, the concentration of wealth results in the capture of politics by wealthy elites. For example, they can aggressively lobby politicians to protect and entrench their veterans' interests or control media to influence how people think and make decisions. This means in the absence of economic liberalization, which you uniquely get, they're unlikely to ever get a functioning democracy. But thirdly and importantly, even if elections are to an extent functional, we think democracy leads to ethnocentric politics. This is because the most reasonable platform for politicians in ethnically divided countries is to prioritize certain ethnicities to cement their support and guarantee their votes. I.e., if you're neutral, you're unlikely to get votes from any ethnicity. This means that the best form of politics opposition side gets is one that only caters to the majority and oppresses the minority in places like Kenya, where the Kikuyu people are always prioritized at the expense of other ethnic groups. This also increases tension on their side of the house. The conclusion of this argument is that at best, opposition side gets a dysfunctional system of accountability. Comparatively, may take a little longer on our side, but we get a proper accountability mech that lasts into the future. I've never been prouder to propose. Thank you for that speech. We welcome the first speaker of the opposition. Um, all right, just give me a few moments to close my fan. Okay, hi, my audible invisible. Okay, great. Okay. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Paris. I'll be the first speaker for team off. I prefer POIs verbally.
Okay. Speech start in three, two, one. Post-revolution, the African people knew their economy was devastated and their homes were destroyed, but they didn't care. For the first time, they felt free from the shackles of colonialism, and it's important to prop up a government that preserves this freedom and their rights to nationhood oppose. One point of setup crucially, we support a world where post-colonial African states prioritize enshrining civil and political rights. A, individuals deserve fair elections that are free from vote buying and intimidation because people deserve agency in the forces that govern them. They deserve to create coalitions and vote for blocks that can represent and negotiate their concerns in politics. B, we would give them the right to assemble, which allows them to formalize their stances and collectivize with those who share similar struggles to join their cause in lobbying. But crucially, greater political rights means they have stronger influence on the government, which dictates both national and local policies and enforces laws and protections for everyone. But for my substantives, a few rebuttals. First, they tell us that they're going to confiscate from the super rich. Note, this is where more people are likely to be in fear of cracking down and conflict. When you take away from the rich, i.e. the lands of the Afrikaners, they will likely retaliate and take up arms left over from the liberation conflict. The meta here is that it would actually be harder to attain this land, therefore taking a longer time to distribute it to the public, meaning that people will stay poor for still a significantly long amount of time on prop. But secondly, I respond to their first claim that post-liberation Africa is poor. Our comparative solves this because we give lands to farmers and revive markets that create jobs. The response here is note that all of this is contingent on the assumption that farmers know what to do with this land, know how to sell this land, and know how to create sustainable markets. Prop had to discuss this through this process or their impact just doesn't happen. I would say that you're unlikely to get this because education is a right that is cemented by civil and political rights when we set up stable political and civil institutions that Prop just doesn't have. So people are just left massively uneducated under their side because all they dealt with is conflict and uh, is conflict and liberation. First substantive then, that civil and political rights are the most urgent concern for post-colonial Africa. The framing here then is that for centuries, African populations were treated as second-class citizens in their land. We shouldn't repeat mistakes of the past by providing rights to help them construct a stronger identity. A few reasons. One, political rights are necessary to create common identity and curb ethnic violence. A, these rights, such as the freedom to assemble and fair elections, are shaped by people's preferences and are crucial for nation building. People need to and can only be represented by four forming coalitions that represent them, e.g. as racial minorities or poor rural groups. In post-colonial South Africa, the white Afrikaner minority restricted the ballot for the African majority, depriving them of representation. The only way to prevent this is through free elections that aren't monopolized by the elite. But B, we create an inclusive national identity. One, political rights protect the freedom to practice religion and culture without interference. On our side, the Ndebele people can practice their beliefs without the Shonda majority cracking down on them in Zimbabwe. Second, more ethnic participation allows diverse representation of different identities in the academe. This enables policies like that in Botswana, where all 12 ethnic groups' as cultures are celebrated in schools. In their world, minorities can't vote or create organizations since their views are silenced by liberation leaders coming from the majority, i.e. Kenyatta being a Kikuyu. C. We mediate conflict and violence. So post-liberation, these states don't have robust systems that quell violence. When citizens are deprived of the ability to decide leaders and feel unrepresented, they default to violence. We saw this in Kenya in 2007, where the rigged elections forced the Luo minority to engage in conflict because a leader was unfairly elected and didn't represent them. In our world, these people are given a peaceful avenue to recognize differences to the ballot. But note, in the absence of a representative parliament, it triggers secession, as we saw with South Sudan feeling unrepresented by the North. With political rights, majority groups have no incentive to include minorities, no, I... allowing them to build racist nationalist sentiment against other identities. This is why it's crucial to reinforce the rights of forming blocks and coalitions so that marginalized groups would be incentivized to cause further division. In our world, people wouldn't have resorted to extreme lengths because they have representation by ballot, access, and vote. Second reason, political rights are the prerequisite to sustainable economic development. A, I'll take you after this argument. A, a representative government ensures economic rights are better achieved. One, states are more likely to equally distribute economic development when they have to cater to voting bases beyond their ethnicity. So if people vote for a leader and demand cash transfers and education programs, we are likely to have equitable economic distribution. But two, we ensure sustainable development through taxation, since taxation is only possible when people trust their leaders and governments. We ensure this by allowing the right to vote and allowing people to decide their leaders, as opposed to it being the unelected elite. This means that we get more education and healthcare that wholly benefit people. 
Note that this is different from providing economic rights to individuals. But B, on the comparative, economic rights don't lead to civil and political rights. This is where I, this is where I deal with the second argument when they try to co-opt by saying it leads to political accountability. I'll prove why that's not true here. So note, there will always be a disparity between the elites and the masses because Yo, they I... will get more resources, either because they are more in number or because they have direct ties to the government. So even if resources were distributed fairly, you're unlikely to do things like challenge authority, especially when the state can easily take it away using the same power they use to give it to you. So in states like Zimbabwe, citizens know that the lands were seized and expropriated and property rights were the things that could states could easily revoke. This is why a more participatory approach to land distribution can only be done when civil and political rights are secured. We recognize that these are going to be long discussions, but these are done much better when political rights are enshrined first. I'll take the point. None. All right. That political reform is far more difficult since elites have incentive to monopolize in political rights given they want more stability in the government. Yeah, under our side, we would rather enshrine political and civil rights where we strengthen the current government and the rights that people deserve, as opposed to having an unelected elite being the person in power without any checks and balances. Twofold impacts to our first argument. One, we ensure post-liberation Africa gets short-term stability, which is crucial because you need short-term stability to get to long-term change. But two, we demonstrate that we get more sustainable economic development when we ensure that there is trust in the state and greater accountability in the process. Second argument, that civil and political rights are less susceptible to failure and in mismanagement. The frame here is that these post-colonial nations lack transparent bureaucratic processes, have weak institutions, and inefficient checks and balances. The policy of redistributing land would not only fail, but also ruin these developing economies. This also deals with their first push. A few reasons. One, the struggle for liberation, no thank you, was unequal, with concentrated power towards certain groups as granted by the colonizers. So some ethnic groups were given more rights and more land compared to others. So A, ethnicities had different contributions towards the revolutionary struggle. For instance, in Kenya, the Kikuyu ethnic group were the largest group that contributed in the Mau Mau uprising because they were the strongest group with the most access to resources. But B, systems of indirect rule allowed colonizers to choose certain ethnicities to rule over others. So post-liberation, these groups were more advantaged. But second reason, this opens up the door for abuse. Two key reasons. A, massive corruption in the distribution of land. Due to the lack of records and the rightful owner of lands prior to colonial rule and the lack of bureaucratic infrastructure to process requests, the process of redistribution will be incredibly corrupt. Dominant ethnicities can redistribute land towards themselves rather than to minority groups. So an official from the Hausa tribe can prioritize their kin and not give land to the rightful owner from the Igbo tribe. So these conflicts over land cannot be solved by any pragmatic means or economic reasoning because the point of tension is a group's historical or cultural claim to this. This then further drives economic tensions. In our world, political rights are less prone to corruption as it is much easier to implement by giving access to ballots. Moreover, any unfair distribution is more likely to be scrutinized since all groups want universal access due to the fear of being disenfranchised next. But B, this process is likely to descend into violence. Why? One, the expropriated land and businesses are likely to have had existing Afrikaner owners with vested interests. Just like the Rhodesian Bush War, they would have likely had arms and funds left over from the conflict. This proves that on side prop, their world is more prone to mismanagement and failure. On our side, we ensure that these states are built on stabler structures opposed. Thank you for that speech. We welcome the second speaker of the proposition. Hi, am I clearly audible and visible? Well, cool. I'll take POIs through chat, but if I don't take you by 6.30, feel free to verbally POI me. Speech will start in three, two, one. If it is true that on our side, benefits trickle down to the most vulnerable, wait, sorry, give me a second. Hi, I'm so sorry. I realized that my earphones weren't in. Is it okay if I restart? Sorry, thank you so much. Uh, speech will start in three, two, if it is true that on our side, governments are so corrupt and are going to be so ethnically divided that massive conflicts are going to arise, that is the exact same government that they need to defend. Because their world, and for them to prove that things are going to get better, they needed to structurally tell us why their side was going to decrease these types of political corruptions. 
Two sections of rebuttal before moving on to our split argument on how this increases violent uprising. Firstly, what does our world look like? We told you that this uplifts the economy and gives people minimal rights. We get two responses from opposition. Firstly, they tell us that there is no incentive for this redistribution to be done well because people have already fought against colonialism. Three responses here. Firstly, this misses the nuance of what Yuto tells you. Our stance is that we concede we don't have elections, but we get accountability mechanisms in far other ways that are more sustainable, and they needed to respond to that. On their side, these politicians only want to cater towards close ethnicities because that is the way in which they get a competitive advantage. Whereas if you take a neutral or equitable stance, the people around you will take your votes from you because they give certain groups an advantage. Second, their analysis is that governments are corrupt on our side, but as I point out in my introduction, if that's the case, it's unclear why the distribution of political rights is going to be equal on their side because the government they need to defend are the ones that are going to be that are, are because the governments that they need to defend that are going to implement these changes are the ones that do this before this political change happens but thirdly even if this is true we think benefits are more likely to trickle down to vulnerable people on our side because you can't share your political right on our side, if you get land, you can hire people in your businesses. You can hire people to farm with you. So the land the middle class receives means money is more likely to trickle down to those who are in the more vulnerable positions. The second response they give in their argument is that rich people don't want to give up their land. They're likely to retaliate. Three responses here. Firstly, I don't think this is true, because as we characterized in our first speaker, people who don't have power aren't always elites. They can be people like revolutionaries who are from poor backgrounds. And this is the most likely characterization in the debate, because they are the ones who probably have the highest incentive to fight back, because they're the ones that went through oppression compared to the rich who had privileges before as well. Second, I want to flip this argument to say that elites care more about political rights, because even if it's true that they are primarily profit oriented, if they want to keep the money, they need rights and autonomy to ensure the government doesn't suddenly take away all of their land. Thus, the prerequisite for rich people to enshrine their economic rights, especially in the long term, which is more important because the potential for money there is larger, is contingent on getting political freedom and rights. And this is the most important for them. Because on both sides, these elites are so inherently rich that even if you strip away a large quantity of their wealth to redistribute, they're probably going to live in good standards. The larger risk for these individuals and the larger, more tangible harm is that even if they lose a certain quantity of money, losing what they have left is a more fear-mongering harm, especially when they know that people on the ground probably already resent them because they were quite complacent during the abuses of the past. What this implies then is that elites are more likely to go against political reforms, which means their side takes more political capital to implement, so we take down the premise of their second argument. The last response here is that even if elites backlash on our side, this is not important because this won't deter the capacity of governments to implement these policies successfully. This is for two reasons. Firstly, because as proposition characterizes, governments in these post-conflict areas have a lot of power and buy-in and nationalism. Secondly, Western past colonizers probably have an incentive to ensure these places have good political rights and democracy because their presence ensures that governments have power over these elites. The implication is that it does not matter if it is easier or more difficult because we can push through these anyways and there is an override capacity. The second section of response is which side is better for development. Two things here. First, they tell us that people don't have education to use this land well, but I just am not, but it's just unclear as to why this is important. We think in the long term, people can learn, which is likely to be the case when they're given the opportunity. But secondly, even if it's true there's more that it is more inefficient, we think political rights is less likely to go away in the future. And this is why I'm going to bring back our first argument, which is that when conflicts occur, that uprisings happen, which has historically succeeded in many instances, all the political rights that proposition wants to achieve disappears. On our side, taking away land and money that are already in people's pockets is significantly harder to do because these are homes that are already being survived in and farms that have already been built. And so when you try to take away these things, people are likely to backlash because they tangibly feel these pains, which means the government is less likely to do this in the first place. Sustainability is the most important clash in the debate because there's an infinitely larger number of people who will benefit from having stable democracies in the future. So even if we are slower, we have benefit the larger number of individuals. The second thing they tell you is that political rights are the prerequisite to ensure distribution. I would posit to you that this is exactly the flip, that if you do not have economic stability, you have no capacity to exercise your right in politics. This is for three reasons. First, if you're a black starving farmer who is working 24 seven, you cannot go to rallies or marches because you don't have the time. Second, things like wealth disparity likely exist on their side, which means politics don't function because elites have significant sway over politicians through things like bribery, especially when their own characterization is that there is a lack of check and balance mechanism. But thirdly, landlords have control over peasants and they're, because they are contingent on their survival, so they can coerce them to vote for who they want. Before I move on, I'll take your point. 
why will elites go against political reforms when your model says you will actively take away wealth from them? We're saying that they're unlikely to go against political reforms, which is why we flip your argument. Lastly, let's move on to the split of how this of how this sheltered false hope of democracy spurs deadly uprising. The thesis of this argument is that violent uprising and coups are more likely to happen on opposition. Three reasons. First, poverty increases incentives to start uprising because people have very little to lose because they are already starving. Similar to how Jewish people rallied in concentration camps, knowing that they would probably die because the dire conditions of their life were so bad that dying wasn't much worse. On our side, people have tangible land and money that they're going to lose, which is why they're less likely to do this. Second, when the country is poor, they are unlikely to pay the military well. This means two things. Either A, these people are likely to opt out of the military because they don't want to risk their lives for a small degree of money, which means the country cannot defend defend itself against internal rebellion. But secondly, there are people going to, these people are going to find it more profitable to start their own military coup like they did in Congo to consolidate power, especially when the country is economically deprived and seen as weak. Secondly, that, but lastly, this creates false hope of political reform that is likely to shatter. This is likely to be the case for two reasons. One, politicians campaign on the idea that we will ensure you get your rights and you will get your voice vote to create changes. But secondly, the Western view of democracy is already so glorified to the extent that if people think that they get these types of things and they get political rights, they're going to have the same conception that they're also going to get these rights respected as well. But this is likely to be shattered at the moment in which political power is consolidated for all the analysis that Yuto tells you about, about how in Kenya, you, the opposition leader literally got killed, about how in Congo, there was election fraud and restriction of the media right after voting polls occurred. In our world, we don't give this false hope in the first place because we don't make the promise that you can take control and we keep people's expectations reasonably low. Rather, we encourage people to retain faith in the system right now because even if you have land, they feel that they can create change and they can access broader economic opportunities in the future. Thus, proposition further creates discontent, which is likely to be the tipping point for massive amounts of violence. There's three impacts to this. First, this increases human casualties. Second, this increases poverty and harms crucial infrastructure, which is important for the long term. But third, this reverses all democratic reforms because governments now have stronger incentives to crack down on people to counter uprisings. Similar to how the state of emergency was declared in Central Africa in response to a massive demonstration asking for transparency, you are likely to lose all the political rights that opposition wants. Note that this is not contingent on the success of these massive violences, but it's enough for even a relatively small up uprising to happen for all of the political reforms that opposition wants to be shattered because governments are likely to be risk averse in dangerous times. But even in the, but when they do succeed, the likely things like coups in Algeria, that leads to overhauling of the system where there's absolutely zero guarantee that the new government would continue to respect political rights. So on the likelihood of these rights repaining for a long time for the vast majority of individuals, we are winning. For all those reasons, propose. Thank you for that speech. We welcome the second speaker of the opposite. Am I visible and audible? Right. Uh, just give me a second. Um, POIs through uh, voice, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, start in a bit. <clears throat> Starting my speech in Three, two, one. I think we need to step back a little bit and look at reality because the reality isn't that in the entirety of Africa, people are starving and people are dying. As we know, there are a lot of successful instances of ensuring that we enshrine civil and political rights. The success stories of countries like South Africa or Botswana, where in the instance that they were liberated, people like Nelson Mandela wanted to ensure that they enshrined civil and political rights for the black majority to ensure that the white minority cannot repress them even more. And when we see now, they were not only able to be, to be able to ensure 
political freedoms, but they're able to ensure economic development as a consequence of that freedom that we've granted them. That is what happens under our side. Because on their side, they don't actually explain the likelihood of success of their policy, especially when I would note, things like land redistribution, things like land reform have been an incredibly arduous process that is an incredibly difficult thing to undertake. They only give you one reason as to why it would like to be done well, and that, I think, is what loses them this round. I'll talk about three broad things. Firstly, on economic development. Secondly, on political rights. Lastly, on the extension. Firstly, on economic development. So their main claim is to say that we're able to redistribute wealth and we are able to ensure that we ensure that the poor individuals are able to access to this. There are three problems with this. The first problem with this is we wanted to question to what extent are they able to do this well in the first place. Their only incentive was this one-liner to say that they fought against colonialism, they wanted to unite the country, but they don't actually prove structurally why this incentive overrides every other incentive for them to do this in terrible ways. Clearly, as we had explained, Insofar as you've liberated yourself from colonialism, it's unclear as to why this incentive is overriding. Their only response was to say there are mechanisms for accountability. But when they themselves say that they are an unaccountable elite, they don't actually explain as to why these people are, are accountable to the people or they ought to ensure that this is redistributed well. They don't give you a reason for that. What you have to weigh that one liner with little defense against is our structural analysis as to why they will likely do it in terrible ways. The first reason why they will likely do it in terrible ways is that you're more likely to enrich among ethnic lines. So in the fact that you will likely enrich your Kikuyu base if you come from the Kenyan majority. And the comparative here, quite clearly, is the fact that it is much harder to be as selective under our side insofar you want to ensure you want to enshrine political rights. And the reason is quite simple. The visibility of the depriving people of political rights, especially when everyone should have it, especially when it ought to be inalienable, means that it is much harder to ensure that their side allows that distribution of rights, of economic rights and land to begin with. And the new ones that I want to add here is that land ownership is contentious because there was no record of land in the first place. And insofar as there are multiple people and multiple indigenous tribes claiming that specific land, what likely happens is you will have ethnic cronyism under their side that happens significantly more, as opposed to political rights, where it's not a zero-sum game and you can ensure everyone gets it, it's more likely to be worse off in terms of redistribution under their side. But secondly, as they say themselves, they will have to take, it, take away land from the super rich. When we demonstrate that the rich Afrikaners which immense, with immense wealth can be able to do things like buy private militias, can be able to have their own weaponry to resist against them, what that leads to is violence. Their only response was to say they actually care about, more about their vote rather than their land. But if you think about it, it's quite strange. When their analysis themselves is, your ability to have money can decide, can ensure that you influence politics. But if you take away their wealth, if you take away their land, if you take away the things that they're able, that they need to survive, or the fact that you will encroach Point. on them and take away property, I'm quite sure that is a much bigger encroachment on you, something that will likely require violence and force, and therefore that will likely mean it's bloodshed on their side. But even in the best case where they succeed, it's a fact that in the process of trying to attain it, they will likely be met with resistance, which likely means more people will die on the, as a consequence. The comparative, quite simply, that you don't have to enrage them to that an extent for them to actively come up with arms with you, as we saw in a lot of instances where expropriation was done, where a lot of people resisted it. But the third response is, even in their best case, they don't explain the extent of expertise. And the reality is this, we're not saying that these people, uh, the, the, the reality is the fact that these people structurally just did not have the expertise. Because if you work in a low level position, you were not able to access managerial positions. You were not able to realize that how the outputs and inputs of your production work. You didn't have an oversight of the land. That was the sad reality that a lot of these farmers went through. And the reality is, when this was implemented in Zimbabwe, and Mugabe gave this land to small-scale agriculturalists, they weren't able to adapt to commercial farming and went back to small-scale ag agriculture, which led to massive food drops and massive, massive loss in production. So that was a hard that they needed to deal with. Right. They can't just say they can adapt in the first place. The comparative is quite simple. It's not that we are destitute on our side. We're still able to ensure economic development. One, because we're able to ensure it's better redistributed insofar as you have the political vote to ensure that you are able to access that welfare. But secondly, taxation is only possible when you have trust in the system and trust in governance. In the instance where you're not trustful of that governments taxing you, that is when you're less likely to pay that tax. So on our side, we can redirect taxation to ensure basic welfare, to ensure people are not destitute. And therefore, that's not the margin of this debate. Second, on political rights, their claim is to say that there, you can you have weak institutions and you can lobby governments. Why? One, there's a greater incentive to strengthen these institutions at the point at which you enshrine these rights. It's much easier since it is inalienable and universal, especially when a lot of liberation leaders had to ensure that the, the majority were behind them. Yet Mandela had to ensure that the black majority were enfranchised. So it's quite unclear as to why they wouldn't do that under their side. But secondly, lobbying doesn't matter when obviously the majority of the people in that country are still Africans and therefore they're still likely to want to outvote the white African or minority. But secondly, your legitimacy is, for instance, the ANC is based on ensuring that you give benefits to those people. And therefore, it is unclear to what extent that lobbying still occurs under their side. 
What did they say then? They say that you create ethnic politics under our side. But the nuance here is quite simple. Insofar as you need to win votes and you need to ensure that you win as m- get a wider base as possible, is the fact that politics actually disincentivizes you from being nativistic and from being racist. The fact that you need to get votes out from your group, but from different groups, to be able to outcompete other politicians is a unique disincentive under our side to alienate people. Under their, their side, there is no incentive at all to try to be to try to be inclusive, to try to pander to different groups. And at their point, that is where you're more likely to incite violence when these people have no alternatives whatsoever, but these politicians are more likely to be inflammatory and aggressive. That is what happens then, and their side will likely lead to more violence. Their only response on their our side was an attempt to say that the tipping point actually is when politicians don't fulfill their promises. Um, I don't think this is the case because uh, the fact that other politicians will just say that they will be able to fix those things and be able to ensure that you get that economic welfare, which likely means our comparative where you get little to no representation for minorities is the tipping point for violence. Before I move on to the extension, I'll take a point. Your concession that politicians need to get votes off so they're going to cater towards ethnic groups is literally our case. We're telling you in the comparative they don't have to do this because they're going to be a revolutionary group and that we're happy to trade off elections. You have to engage with the comparative. Politics, politicians win on margins. You need to cater to a wide base because if not, you're more likely to lose. Under your side, if they are an unaccountable elite, to what extent are they more willing to cater to minority groups? To what extent are they willing to redistribute that land to people not of their ethnic majority? Politicians, political rights, and the accountability that is inherent to our side is the sole disincentive to ensure that ethnic cronyism happens under our side. The extension then is that this allows greater foreign investment into democratic states. And I think investment is more likely to flow into democratic states than authoritarian ones under their side for two reasons. One, investors look at key indices like the Freedom House Index as a metric of how politically stable the country is. Investors don't want to channel money into countries with high corruption as they're unlikely to yield a return of investment, as officials can pocket more money under their side insofar as they're unaccountable. But the second thing to point out is the US post-Cold War wanted to prevent countries from opting into communism and spent billions funding democratic states. So they wanted to ensure that strong democratic rights were there. They're more likely to invest in countries that were more dem- democratic than authoritarian than under their side. The reason why this is important is, is even if there's some degree of inequality under our side, and we, we would assume that is true, that, this, that we amass more resources on net. Because in Proposition's best case, when you redistribute existing land and engage in cash transfers, the amount of wealth circulating is largely minimal because all the reasons they say themselves, that these people were unlikely to earn large wages, the fact that the, the, the colonizers extracted a lot of wealth through plunder, extracted their natural resources, meant the only way to ensure we increase the size of the pie overall is to ensure greater foreign investment. Under their side, investors know that, that the government can take away their land at any moment, and therefore you weaken things like investor confidence much more. We win on the political side of the thing of things, but we also ensure economic development for the Africa as a whole. I'm incredibly proud to oppose. Thank you for that speech. We welcome the third speaker of the proposition. Am I audible? Okay, my time begins in three, two, one. It is precisely because of all the things that they say that the majority of African states in the status quo are unable to have sustainable democracy. For all of those reasons, we're proud to propose. I'm gonna engage on three themes. Firstly, on economic and why our side can claim benefits on this, which is round winning. Secondly, I'm going to engage on the theme of democracy, engaging with their point on ethnic tensions and such. And then thirdly, I'm going to bring up a point that they failed to engage to, which is conflicts. Firstly, then, on our points about economic benefits. Now, I just want to, first of all, engage their point that they brought up in like their deputy about how there will be foreign investments in these countries because there's democracy. I just want to question this, the feasibility of this because it's, it's extremely speculative, right? Presumably, these investors won't invest billions of dollars into the nation just because they're the democratic. This didn't happen empirically speaking, and therefore, it's not very likely that that investment will exist. Their side has to actually mechanize why this is feasible. Now, our argument here was that economic benefits are likely to happen for many of the mechanisms that we gave. I'm going to engage to what they engaged to one by one. First of all, 
they say that, like, why would the government distribute fairly, right? But our engagement to this is that the people who are likely to be in power is the nationalists who overturned the government that used to rule in the past. So when there's no elections, they have incentive to not to anger the people because the way in which they got the power initially to overturn the governments is that is by the popular power, right? Moreover, the way in which they get overthrown, their current state of power gets overthrown is through massive protests and such. Therefore, insofar as they have an active incentive to try not to anger the majority, they have the incentive to try to distribute this land fairly amongst all ethnicities. Therefore, this is a mechanism for why the government is likely to distribute fairly. And then secondly, they say something about how like ethnic unaccountability and how the record of lands is not there. Two responses. Firstly, factually, I challenge this on set, right? We can just counter assert that there is record of land, given the fact that these are likely to be from like 200 years ago. It's still likely that things like land records still existed. And moreover, given that developed nations like England was the one that who invaded these countries, it's very likely that they keep precise note of who was in rule of which area. But secondly, presumably, given the incentive that I said earlier about how governments have the incentive to allocate fairly, it's very likely that the government will allocate fairly. But then thirdly, they challenge the feasibility of this argument, that elites would get really, really mad and you would have to fight them. I'm going to flip this argument and say that elites are more likely to be mad on their side of the house. Because the thing is, on both sides of the house, you're going to enrage the elites to a certain degree. Because they are both affected by their political monopoly being taken away and their economic capacity being taken away and being redistributed, right? The comparative then becomes on which side is elites likely to be less mad. Now, elites are likely to be less mad on our side of the house because even if they lose some of their land, they're still likely to be an upper class, right? However, when you actually give the people the right to actually speak up, and if all side government says it's true, it's very likely that then their whole power will collapse, and therefore it's very likely that their whole land will be taken away. They'll suffer disproportionate impacts. Therefore, it's very likely that elites are more interested in pursuing a monopoly over the political rights and land. Then the fourth thing. So even if we can't claim fair distributions, which is our worst case, by putting economic and land reparation at the priority, we have reasonable fiat to say that even if the extent of the impact we can claim is relatively marginal, we can still claim some kind of impact on land and economy, and therefore there will be some allocation of land and economy to the people on the ground. I'm going to take this argument a step further then. So why I'm going to prove to you why even if you get unfair distribution, i.e. only small portion of the land, why we can still claim all of our benefits and why that's round winning. So we told you, in first, this is for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that we told you in first that multiplier effects happen. So if you have your own land, presumably you can grow crops, you can sell it, and you are likely to make decisions in a way that maximizes your utility and how it multiplies this money, which means that we can claim our impacts on the economic benefits for the individuals on the ground. They minorly engage with this by saying that my, these people don't have education. But even if you don't have education, you have the ability to assess what maximizes your utility, right? For example, growing two crops increases your capacity to stay safe economically and such. Therefore, I don't think these are hard decisions. They can claim this without education. But secondly, this is like individuals are likely to uh, like economic reforms produce linear outcomes and politics is very zero sum. So the problem with political reform is that it's all or none. So in other words, even if you're granted the right to vote, if the government doesn't have the incentive to listen to you and does things like election fraud, it's very unlikely that it creates any pragmatic change. On our side of the house, if you're given even just a small number of money, it can lead to bigger outcomes for the reason that we provided above. Therefore, it's very likely that if the comparative is that on their side, you get small portion of political rights, and on our side, you get small portion of economic rights, the comparative lies on our side. With that, why is this in and of itself debate winning in the sense that even if we lose that on all of the economic democratic benefits, we can win independently on economy? Because it's very likely that for the majority of individuals in this debate, which are extremely poor farmers in post-colonial Africa, they're literally struggling to find food on the table and they're unable to get education and the right to free speech is unlikely to be of much importance. They don't contest with this weighing. So uh, before I move on to my second theme about democracy, I'll take a POI. So your only mitigation that this causes civil violence when the elite rises up is that they're going to have some of their land left. But if I'm not mistaken, isn't all of the land of these elite unjustly acquired by, the, by these people? Even if it's unjustly require, acquired, we framed a model that they would be redistributed to the people to a portion of degree. So they're likely that they're still going to be able to own some kind of land, and therefore we can still claim all of our impacts. So by the end of this, I'm able to prove to you that economy can be claimed on our side, even if it's a small portion, which leads to a bigger impact, and that's why we independently win. I'm going to engage secondly on the theme of democracy. Two things. Firstly, why the ethnic tension will get worse on their side. Secondly, why we can get sustainability. Firstly, then, why the tension between ethnicity will likely get worse. 
So this is by far the least important delta in the debate. And so far as these ethnic minorities are likely to be caring more about financial liberations than whatever their ability to like free speech and et cetera. But essentially, all of PM's material was that division between ethnicities exists and giving them political voice in elections will lead to more sustainable politics. I have three or four engagement. Firstly, this tension will exist symmetrically, right? Yong already told you this. Even if you don't give them votes, supposedly there will be a huge fight over which ethnicity is the most powerful in politics. Therefore, this point is completely destroyed insofar as this tension is likely to exist symmetrically. But secondly, let me break down their premise that coalition and voice will not matter in this debate because the crucial context of this debate is that this exists in a paradigm where there's a lack of political infrastructure given that they just recently got independence. Therefore, it's very likely that there's likely not much accountability. This means that the current government if their side is true in saying that they have bad incentives, it's likely to manifest in the worst forms, like for example, oppression of these coalitions in these voices. Therefore, it's not very likely that this matters in the debate. Thirdly, I'm gonna flip their arguments in two ways. Firstly, the ethnic group that over likely overthrew the colonial government is the ethnic party that supposedly got the support from majority of other ethnic groups because they needed arms and they needed that power, right? Therefore, we can claim that this that these parties actually have the incentive to cater to other ethnic minorities as well. But secondly, you significantly increase the capacity for ethnicities to be disproportionately be affected in politics. Because insofar as there is election, it's much more likely that they will want to secure votes. And the easiest way for politicians to do so is ethnicity, right? This increases fighting on the grounds of ethnicities. They say something else that they want to cater to the majority, but that's really hard to do. The easiest way to garner support as a politician, exactly given their framing that ethnic tension is likely exist in these nations is to cater to people's interest of their ethnicities and therefore this ethnic tension will likely get worse on their side of the house and then thirdly i just want to rehash our point on conflicts that got no engagement which is that the, these people are likely to mat, uh, these ethnic tensions moreover their inability to like be able to have this economic independence is likely to result in the worst form of impact given all of the mechanisms that we gave you in your speech for all those reasons we're incredibly proud to stand on the winning side Thank you for that speech. We welcome the third speaker of the opposition. Hi, am I audible and visible? Yep. Okay, uh, please give me a second. I'll just get my timer. All right. Realize to chat, please. I'll try to accept one in between issues. Okay. okay. Speech start in three. Okay. Speech start in three, two, one. It took centuries for African states to break the shackles of slavery and colonial rule. They must not be able to be explurged now into decades of conflict. I want to make two strategic observations before I proceed to make clashes. Firstly, if it's true that political rights won't be respected, it is unclear to opposition why redistribution won't be respected will suddenly be respected as well. It is unclear why proposition seems to assert that a lot of the harms and a lot of the loopholes and elites, something that they'll pursue on political redistribution, but suddenly they won't do it in economic redistribution, especially since Prop 1 didn't just claim that you're going to redistribute wealth, you're also going to redistribute the sources of wealth, and that means the elites can't even recoup the wealth even if they lose it. But secondly, they said that there's a lack of political infrastructure. It is also unclear why, the, in, our, in their side, you suddenly have sufficient economic infrastructure to ensure equi equitable redistribution across all ethnic groups, especially since what we explain down Go the on. bench is that a lot of minorities 
were barred from owning these lands. You know a lot of their records might not even be existent exactly because they were not allowed to own these things. If there were, it is the fact that they were decades and even centuries apart and are likely to be disputed within each other given that colonizers made arbitrary lands and divided communities up it's unclear then why proposition is able to assure that their policy will succeed. Then this is important because a lot of their benefits literally rely on equitable distribution and it be sure. and it being successful. This is not to say that political representation is something that is successful on our side. But what opposition has to prove is that it will be marginally better and that we're able to lessen the majority of the extreme Point. harms that we have explained. On to the clashes then. Chat, please. Firstly, which is the prerequisite? Economic or political rights? I want to raise two points. One, you need accountable democratic institutions to ensure a lot of proposition benefits, especially if the proposition model is a committee. Like, what if that committee is ORI, especially since the reason of a common enemy existing as an incentive is not compelling at all, given that these colonizers are already gone. But secondly, they said it's revolutionary leaders and the only re and the only reason that they gave as to why they usually come from the minorities because they have a lot to fight for. But we also want to take note that even majority but that people from the majority were also oppressed. And that's why they even joined the revolution to begin with. We gave you structural reasons as to why they tend to be in the majority groups. First is that they're the ones that can easily round up more people to join the revolution exactly because they came from the dominant group. But secondly, that they are richer and can what? fund the revolution, that is what happened in, in, Zim, in, Zim, in, Zimbab in Zimbabwe. The conclusion to this is that on their side of the house, they literally have to contend that the redistribution will literally be handled by elites or people from the majoritarian groups. The problem is that they have no checks and balances, at least we do. The second thing I want to deal with is that the elite can skew elections. Firstly, if this is actively rigging, we have whistleblowers and journalists. If anything, it's on their side where rigging is more potent because we never tried establishing a Bill of Rights. We never tried to ensure the protection of whistleblowers and journalists. On our side of the house, if they try to suppress journalists around, like a polit politician tries to do that, that's even if they don't get like found out, it's already a red flag and it implicates themselves already. But secondly, on this point that people are beholden to land owners and that's why their, their vote will be skewed. One, how will they know who you vote for? Your vote is private in the voting booth. But secondly, that's why we need constitutions that would protect human rights. It is a false dichotomy that we have to defend owners not paying their workers well because that is literally things that are protected in constitutions which we are able to strengthen when we preclude political rights before economic representation to begin with. So in conclusion, I would posit that political rights do preclude economic benefits and it is untrue that a, a proposition can claim otherwise. The second issue then is in preventing conflict and medi mediating differences. Before that, POI. So on your comparative on which one is the prerequisite, our claim was that you don't need ac accountable parties to claim our impact on the economy. Insofar as being given a small portion of land is enough for our whole impact to stand in a way to stand in this debate. How do you engage with that? If assuming the best case that they give you that land, haven't you questioned if the state can take it away? Which they could, especially if you can't vote, if, especially if you can't rally, and especially if you can't even assemble together. The second issue then, on preventing conflict and mediating differences. And before, before I proceed, I want to point out the contradiction. So P3 says that the elite don't like political rights, but P2 argues that they prefer political rights. So which really is it? We think it's one or the other. And this is important because this literally takes out a lot of their reputation that P3 launches or else it contradicts their partner. Three things I want to point out. If it's true that landowners and the elites are immensely heart powerful, I would like to ask how will they react? We suggest that it would be a violent way. The comparative on our side is that we incite violence less. Why? Because taxation does not remove their wealth massively or entirely. And this is important because on their side, you're literally removing their source of wealth. On our side, even if you tax it, since they still have the source of their wealth, they can recruit that wealth anyway. So there's more buy-in. But secondly, they said that the only point of dem democracy is being majoritarian. One, smaller groups can form coalitions and blocks to get representatives. But additionally, ethnicities would be very wary when legislation about repression about other ethnicities are being passed on. And the reason as to why is because they're scared that they might be the next ethnicity that will be subjected to this type of policy. But secondly, 
in the most consequential legislation that usually happens on amendments, that usually happens in massive funding bills, you often need a super majority. So there's an incentive to actually appeal to groups, even smaller ones, if you want legislation to pass. And that's how the incentive for the majorities to even care about like smaller ethnic groups. Lastly, assuming the worst case, democracies offer a non-violent alternative, especially since it's inherent for people to have disagreements. Like, let's assume that they're both ethnically different. That is not going to disappear on proposition side. Democracies allow an avenue that is not violent inherently, that you can vote for different representatives, that can join politi different political blocks and have disagreeing ideology. Even if you still lead to conflict, it becomes a last resort instead of a first resort. On their side, because they have funds to arms, as Proposition says, if that's the case, then it's literally more likely, especially since ethnic strife might still be existent on their side. On the last issue then, on the access to basic needs and development. One is on the access to basic needs. We have access to welfare because we have transparent governments, which means spending goes into public housing, education, and healthcare. On their side, you have to believe that everyone will be able to spend properly. On our side, you just have to believe one actor will be able to do so. And you've proven why that is more assured when you have um, stronger political representation. Secondly, even if you still have economic mobility, one, a lot of developmental infrastructures such as roads and water lines need good urban planning that requires a functional government. This is to make sure that places like Malawi, for example, have access to resources like waters or roads to transport goods. It's unclear to me how having a parcel of land would ma even matter if you don't have a water line going through it or a road that can transport your goods to begin with. But secondly, it is short term because of the high risk of mismanagement. Especially if we're talking about people who went from handing small scale industries to massive resources. In Zimbabwe, you, the abrupt land expropriation caused severe food shortages. In Ghana and Zambia, the mining industry tanked because they were run by inexperienced people. This is important because once the resources are mismanaged, it's difficult to go back once you've starved people that has already happened. We conclude then that if you want to preserve not only the political and human rights of these people, but also economic development, not just now, in, but also in the future, we compel you to side with the opposition. Thanks. Thank you for that speech. We welcome the opposition to reply, Speaker. Am I visible and audible? All right, I'll start in a bit. Starting my speech in three, two, one. I think an important thing to note in that in a prep motion like this, it's unclear as to what propositions world looks like, what countries are they representing, what examples are which this is done successfully, where we explain, and in the vast majority of states where they did this, this is actually terrible. In, Z in Ghana and Zambia and Zimbabwe, when they did do this, it led to mass economic shock, it led to mass economic downturns. But on the comparative, we explain and we champion countries like South Africa and Botswana who prioritize civil and political rights to ensure that in the long term, economic development is much better assured. And the nuance here is quite simple. Economic reparations and land redistribution is incredibly difficult, and it is a long-term process, and you needed to ensure you had strong democratic institutions before you engage in that process. Three things in this speech. Firstly, on economic development. The first question to ask is, will they allocate it fairly? Their only mechanism is, these elites re rely on a broad majority for support, so they will still remain accountable. As we explained, even coming from first, we gave you reasons as to why this is not true. One, the struggle was only participated by the largest and most dominant groups. So for instance, the Kikuyu base in Kenya. Secondly, due to indirect rule, colonizers granted power to specific ethnic groups and not other ethnic groups. So they remain in power even after liberation. So for instance, the Hausa majority or the Tutsi majority or the Tutsi, uh, Tutsi ethnicities within those countries. What that means is they're only hanging thread for all their benefits. The incentive to redistribute fairly is disproven. And the impact is massive. It's not just that they have little benefit, but also it leads to more ethnic violence when native lands are unfairly distributed to other ethnicities and away from those ethnicities, which likely means it leads to more conflict under their end. They don't prove allocation was fair. Secondly, let's assume allocation was fair. We explained that you're more likely to have civil war and resistance by these elites. The elites will have their money taken away and their land taken away and engage in violence. 
their only attempt to respond to this was to say, no, they actually care more about ensuring that they have the right to vote. The first thing to note is, just note it on proximity. The fact that these people will have to go to your land, hold you at gunpoint, take away all your wealth, and remove all the land that you ever owned within that country will likely mean this is a massive threat to you. Compare that to your, your fear that someone will speak out against you, your fear that you will be polit that there's political opposition to you, when you can use that wealth to, to res resist those things, will likely mean the resistance on the, their side is literal death. Even if they are successful, it leads to more death and destruction when these people resist the economic reparations. And the last thing to note is expertise. And they never actually proved that this was, allowed, this was likely to be successful. We gave you structural reasons as to why the expertise was likely minimal. And then you transitioned all commercial farms to subsistence farms that likely lead to mass economic harms. On weighing, it is quite clear. Even if there's minimal political rights on our side, the comparative isn't just some money. The comparative is ethnic conflict, elite conflict, and mass starvation. On our side, we ensured there was taxation for basic welfare, especially when people trusted government. And secondly, to no response, more investment. When you have a democratic state, we ensure there's transparency and accountability mechanism for millions of dollars that comes from other countries. So we ensure we clearly win on economic development. Secondly, on political rights. Their only response was to say it was much easier to lobby governments when you had money. The first thing that we point out, the fact that the majoritarian nature of democracies means that the Afrikaner minority is unlikely to continually lobby to the extent that they were able to still control politics, especially when the ANC's legitimacy is based on ensuring that people under their rule are more likely to be given rights. But the second thing to note is, even if you don't buy that, there's the fact that you need to ensure that these rights are inalienable and universal, because that's the inherent nature of it, as opposed to the more controversial rights of economic reparations and who owns what, which therefore means our ability to redistribute this, our ability to ensure proper economic political rights is more likely to accrue. But let's say you don't buy that. At the very least, what we ensure is you prevent ethnic conflict in the first place. They say we create ethnic politics. But the point is, ethnic division and ethnic discrimination still happens under their side, but the means is now under our side. Politicians have the incentive on margins to ensure that you cater to a wider base because politics is inherently one on margins. On our side, we have some mechanism to mitigate it under their side. There's unclear as to why these ethnic, ethnic these forms of ethnic discrimination are unlikely to be mitigated in any form. That's what causes more violence as we have seen throughout history. Lastly, on co-optation, they just say people are destitute and therefore will not vote. As we noted, that is not the margin of this round, we ensure basic welfare. But in the comparative, we explain that if you know the government can expropriate land as they did previously, they can do it again, and therefore you are unlikely to speak out against this government, and therefore you're unlikely to clamor for political rights in the instance you know they have immense power over you. On economic rights, on political rights, on being able to co-opt these two things, we clearly win this debate. Thank you for that speech. We welcome the proposition to reply, Speaker. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Speech will start in three, two, one. If all opposition wanted to fight the example war, we're winning. Congo, Kenya, CAR, Algeria, all of these are countries that prioritize short-term giving of the right to democracy that was overturned by an election fraud, oppressive regimes arising in the chaos, and ethnic conflicts that arise in response to more ethnically polarized parliaments. On our side, we can have unique accountability for the mechanisms we gave you in first that get absolutely zero engagement. The most important clash in the debate that opposition fails to respond to is sustainability, because even if allocation is not fair, there's an infinitely larger number of people who will benefit from having stable democracies in the future. Even if we are slower, even if we sacrifice the rights and the freedom of speech of a few individuals right now, we are more important on a scale. And that is why it was so large and, and it was losing for them that they failed to respond to this. Three sections. First, let's talk about the likelihood of success. Note, this was the premise to all the opposition's argument, because as we told you down the bench, if opposition wanted to characterize governments as being so corrupt that they were going to do this redistribution poorly, this was the exact same government that were going to give people political rights on their side. So the accountable mechanism that governments, so the non-accountable mechanisms that government wants to characterize are the same people that make constitutions, are the same people that make policies on theirs. So if their characterization was that almost 
So this was their characterization. This is uniquely the reason why every country in Africa has unshattered, unaccountable democracies right now. I'm then going to talk about two specific things here. Firstly, on the incentive of elites, my question here is quite simple. Would you rather risk losing all of your money or give up a large amount but still live comfortably? I think it's the latter. Because even if you lose a lot of money as an elite, they are so powerful that this doesn't impact the standard of living for these individuals as much. The larger harm for them is losing all of their political rights because that means all of the rest of their money was also going to get taken away. And that was why it was significantly harder for opposition to claim that change is going to happen on their side because elites are less willing to give this up. Secondly, on accountability, we come analytically prior here because we structurally prove why we're more likely to get accountability. Because when things like governments getting overthrown happen, when military coups happen, it is far easier for people to hold governments accountable for taking away their land than taking away their political rights because whether or not a political right exists is very subjective. Secondly then, let's talk about who is the prerequisite of who. Whip very lately says that people aren't going to lose this land well. We don't need to prove this. That's not on our burden. Rather, we told you that even if people use this land in a terrible way, having economic benefits was the prerequisite to getting political rights. And this was the winning argument that we didn't get engagement from. This is for two reasons. One, that having good constitutions do not matter if people cannot go to that voting booth, if people cannot go to that rally in protest because they have to be working on their farm 24-7 because their landlords take away all of their money. But secondly, even if you can go to the voting booth on their side, there are invisible measures, there are invisible measures like election fraud, which are likely to happen on their side, as we see in the status quo in Africa. They needed to engage with this because insofar as they don't, we come analytically prior to them. Lastly, let's talk about the scale of impact, because even if you do not buy anything I told you for three minutes, we win on the scale and on the way. All they say is that land is likely to be taken away. Let's be charitable and say it's speculative at best as to who gets more of what, whether we get more political rights or they get more economic benefits. We still win this for two reasons. First, because of the sustainability wing that I gave you at the top that were able to help and influence millions and increasingly more number of people on a scale. But second, on the money multiplier effect that we told you about down the bench, that political reform is all or nothing, where you have to make the government listen or the majority to opt into you to get any reforms. For economic reforms, we told you there were likely to be linear outcomes. So even if the amount of money you got at the start was small, even if governments redistributed this in an unfair way, you can find ways to make your life better with that. And we specifically specifically told you that this was likely to have trickle-down benefits for the most vulnerable individuals because they never prove why they're able to help those people on a structural matter. We told you that when middle-class individuals get money, which is likely to happen for the characterization we gave you about who was likely to be the people in power, which was nationalists on our side, those people had an incentive to do this, which means that they were likely to make things like farms, they were likely to start things like small businesses, which hired the most vulnerable, which made money circulate in our economy. They needed to respond to our analysis. For all those reasons, propose. Thank you for that speech. Thanks, everyone, for the debate.